Hi, I'm Hansi, and you are invited to the Climate Conversations, in which we talk with leaders of businesses, initiatives, and think tanks about possible solutions to climate change in India. You're welcome to join in. Four hours of driving from Bangalore Airport, and we are outside Tiptu, a small town in Karnataka. Why are we here? Actually, we're here to see a very special person and talk about a very special experiment. One, if scaled, can actually change farming, not just in India, but globally. And it has implications for your and my health. Let's find out who it is and what we're talking about. Thank you, Shashi, for making the time. So before we start, tell us where we are. We are in a small town, Tiptur, in Karnataka. How big is Tiptur and how far are we from the town? Hey, Ansi, thanks uh, for coming down. Um, it's a pleasure hosting you. So we are, um, a, a Tiptur is a small town of around 80,000 people. Um, we are around uh, 16 kilometers away from the town. Um, this is Akshay Kalpa's uh, research and development facility. Okay, where actually we are shooting here. Okay, this is um, one of our research program going on for last six years, where we are trying to prove a small farm is viable, especially on the production of greens and vegetables. Okay, middle of that R&D facility right now. Right. So we're sitting between the ginger and the radish. Yeah, yeah it's it's uh, radish. Yeah. And um, and Tiptur itself is. Uh, sort of 200 kilometers out of Bangalore, right? Yes, it's around 150 kilometers uh, of northwest of Bangalore. Okay, yeah. right. So you started Akshay Kalpa now 2010, I believe. Yeah. Tell us what you were doing and what made you quit your professional life and start Akshay Kalpa. What was the big problem that worried you that made you start this? Since it's a little bit long answer, okay, first um, uh, I should ask, so so I came from a technology industry and uh, moved into a farming, okay? Akshay Kalpa is a farming company. Um, so you should ask a question, why I became an engineer? Okay, first question, let's ask that, okay? Why did you become an engineer? An engineer. So not that uh, I had a great engineering skills, but I was born in a farming family. And um, day one, any child born in a farming family, parents, what they do is, hey, your job is to score 100 out of 100 in physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology. That's the only job you have, and you have to get out of farming. So that's exactly how my father, okay, saw me becoming an engineer. That's the reason I became an engineer. In the 70s? Yeah, it's um, uh, early 90s, okay, I oh, should early say. Oh, okay. Yeah, early yeah. 90s, okay. okay. And um, if you ask why, why did he make the decision, we, he saw a, a um, engineer who is making good amount of money, doing a very good life in Bangalore. So he wanted his child also to be an engineer. So the problem we uh, around 27 people from Wipro, okay, uh, in 2010 we decided, hey, you know, we'll go back and solve this problem of people, okay, uh, just want to become engineers, doctors, okay, chartered accountants. Can also can we also make farming a viable okay profession of choice? For example, when you graduate, you also should um, okay like to become a farmer, okay, just not an engineer or just not a doctor or just not a chartered accountant. So that's the whole uh, problem statement we are trying to solve in Akshay Kalpa. Mm. Uh, but why did you think of that? I mean, what was what was wrong with engineering or what was right with farming or like why would so you? There is nothing wrong in engineering. In fact, we need good engineers, good engineering. So I came, I'm an engineer, so I can't say my engineering is bad. But the problem, uh, Hansi, is young people are not coming to farming. If the young people are not coming to farming, okay, a long viability of a farming becomes questionable. Um, over a period of time, uh, we'll only see age population in uh, farming. In fact, that's indeed the case in the country right now. So Akshay Kalpa right now works in around 900 villages. In 400 villages, there is no population below 45 years of age. So that's where we are now. So the reason why we want to go, we wanted to go to uh, villages and encourage farmers to become entrepreneurs is we wanted to show young people, hey, you know what, you can be as good as an engineer 
okay or you can be as good as a chartered accountant but you can still be a farmer so uh, the vocation is viable and uh, you can live a comfortable life give a good uh, education to children look after parents better have a good uh, lifestyle in villages as well doing farming so that's that's what we are trying to do okay so let's now discuss akshay kalpa what did you start it as and and what has it become so your problem statement was let's make farming a viable yes. and attractive proposition for young people yes. yeah this is 2010 and you came returned from the us came to this place and you decided you're going to change the world tell us more so it's uh, yes so we all thought uh, we can go back to farming and uh, change the world but in 12 years of journey i think um, the reality what it says is we changed ourselves Uh, our outlooks okay on farming in 2010 what we wanted to do was you know go to village identify women we should ask why women okay because 80% of farming work is done by women we wanted to identify women okay who are in distress okay they have got a small piece of land and we wanted to get them to a common place and uh, do a lot of capacity building and ask them to go back um and set up okay farming based enterprises in the village this is exactly how we got started but later on we realized you know uh, women in distress need lot more support different support not an entrepreneurial support they need lot of psychological support there are lot other aspects associated with uh, okay dealing with them so then we thought okay let's start working with farming families so this is exactly how our journey started uh, started working with farming families what we do now we is go to a village identify one farming family work with them okay in a prolonged period of time um and make sure their earning from farming actually is gone to the substantial uh, uh, level that's what we do right so you you did you you lose your you stopped focusing on women per se because you didn't have that psychological support yes. that they yes. needed because you wanted to teach them farming yes So now you work with families, yes. and how does that work? Do you sort of do the R and D here, figure out how to do it? I mean, how did you learn that? Did you did that have because of your farming background? Did you already have that knowledge, or did you have to first do R and D in terms of what works, what doesn't, and so on? Yes, there are two problems. Okay, so yes, inherently I had a farming background. I understood farming. but uh, when you go to okay um, a village okay and trying to explain a farmer you know do it like this you need a lot of demonstrations and uh, also why would he listen to you this is exactly the point see the fundamental problem what we are trying to say is we need a working demonstration the the extension work okay farming they are they believe in seeing they believe in feeling okay touching okay rather than theory so initial stages was little bit difficult for us and uh, what first we did was we came here and uh, we try to identify what are the problem areas okay for example dairy we went little bit deeper and set up a small dairy unit and demonstrated you know this exactly how dairy can be done differently okay um, then we selected a first farmer and worked with him for 2 years we didn't work with any other farmers made that farming viable once we did that farmer started saying hey you know this works the this exactly how the journey started but you did the experiment here first yes so what was different in how you approached farming so c- compared to say conventional wisdom okay. as to what how farming is done what were you doing differently and then so that the farmers could replicate that see one fundamental uh, difference what we did was that we need to cut off external inputs into the farming the for example you should not buy any manures from outside but okay so today so just just to for people's people's understanding today farming so the the what what i as an urban dweller understand about farming in india is that over the years the land parcels are getting smaller and smaller as people divide between their sons and that's why it's not viable also they have to apply a lot of pesticides and fertilizers and so on um so there's subsidies for that and then we also know about the farmer protests last year about in terms of uh, off take acqu- ac- uh, acquisition of their produce so i believe i'm sure there are problems in each one of those stages so now talk us through where do you see the problems and what did you do different so to make farming viable fundamental part is 
can we cut off external inputs into production side of the farming? This one side is a market side of the problem, we will discuss that. But um, for example, the farmer protest was mostly to do with the market side of it. Okay. So on the production side, if you really okay, come and see, fundamentally we put a lot of external inputs okay, because the soil is not good. Okay, and um, the soil carbon has really depleted okay, almost okay, to desertification level. 0.5% soil carbon actually we declare as a desert. Most of the okay, farms, if you go and measure soil carbon, which is 1% to 1.5%, it is almost equivalent to a desert. So that is where we started. Okay, but the moment you make a statement, cut off external inputs. So what should we? What should farmers do? So we need to teach them. Okay, how to integrate a biomass? Okay, into the hedges in the farm. Okay, and able to make manure themselves. So to make manure themselves, okay, then we started looking at a dairy, okay, as one option where dung can be used, okay, and with lot of biomass we can produce, okay, uh, manure at a scale, okay, in a small farm. So those are the fundamental starting points in our intervention. So once that intervention is done, okay, then we started looking at efficiencies of how things are going in, for example. We took dairy as an example, okay, went very deep into the dairy. So what did we do? We saw the animal productivity is very, very low. The question is why? Okay, in India, okay, we have millions of millions of cows, okay, around 300 plus million cows, okay, and a um, lot of, uh, let me say, milk we produce. But efficiency of that production is very low. Started looking at. Fundamental problem is how we feed the cow is different. So that a cow is a ruminant, okay, she needs to be fed with forages, but what we do, okay, we do, we feed it an agricultural waste, basically uh, straw, okay, and uh, get an external concentrate inputs, okay, from companies and feed it. So the question is, cut off external concentrate inputs, can we start growing feed and fodder what is required for the cows? Okay. Similarly, we went into greens and vegetables very, very deep. Okay, try to understand, so what are the fundamental problems in growing greens and vegetables? Okay, uh, when you cut off external inputs, be it manure, be it pesticides, sprays, everything. So we went deep and started looking at soil aspect of it, and we do a lot of work on soil. So these are the two fundamental things, okay, one is cutting off external inputs and uh, going very, very deep in soil management. That's, right. what, that's what we are doing right now. And you started with the premise that they are growing vegetables as opposed to paddy, which is rice or wheat, the, the cereals, right? So you start with these small farmers, you were making them grow. And, and why did you choose these particular fruits and veggies? So let's ask a question. So what are the fundamental requirements of okay, my kitchen? So actually it was mapped back from, okay, what is required in the kitchen? So that's exactly how we mapped um, what is a consumer needs and what the farmer should do. This connect in the country is currently, it is missing. So farmer is, farmer is growing certain things in a silo, consumer is looking for certain things in a silo, they are, they are not talking to each other. So if a consumer doesn't want it, farmer should not grow it, okay, one aspect. Second thing is biodiversity in the farm is very, very critical. Mono cropping is one of the biggest problems what we face. Every okay nook and corner of a farm, we need to economize it by diversification, not by growing a mono crop. So that's what we did. So what we did is centrally we integrated a dairy. So okay, we use the dung as a means to generate okay uh, manure at a scale, and started looking into the soil aspect, and diversified the farm into various greens, vegetables, backyard poultry beekeeping okay uh, and of course dairy being one of the main aspects and um, a lot of millets everything we started looking okay in a very very diversified manner and uh, market risk for the farmers okay actually are falling because there is always a market risk we need to factor okay that one in okay the modern farming system if one crop fails i think other crop okay should make sure that he is making some money it's very very important so Soil, manage, soil management leading into the diversification of the farm. Okay, for example, the plot what you are sitting around, one acre 
okay, model okay, uh, of a growing greens and vegetables and fruits, bananas, mulch. Okay, you, 25 crops have been integrated, 25 greens and vegetables have been integrated. In one acre? One acre. Okay, and this actually can feed 100 families very easily. This one acre one can acre, feed yes, 100, 100 families. families very uh, obviously, their farmer family will also live off that, but yes. they can sort of serve 99 other families. Then, yes. Right. So then the whole idea is, if this can feed 100 families from greens and vegetable requirements, which are both seasonal and planned, okay, we don't do anything which is unseasonal. Um, can we engage those 100 families, okay, and link, okay, to a farmer, okay, and establish that relationship? That's what Akshakalpa is doing right now. Right. Okay. So when you go into a village, um, the farmer has to have this one acre land or more, I assume. What is a typical sort of farmer engagement you have? See, right now from a land holding point of view, there are two ways we define land holding. Okay. One is what is ownership. Okay. How much land they own. So next is how much land they can lease. A okay, lot of land leaves that's available. A lot of people are left farming. So at a five thousand rupees per acre per annum, you can lease an acre of land. That is that cheap. Okay. So now what we have enabled by okay possession, land possession, okay, Akshakalpa farmers have five acres under possession, but ownership is around two acres of land. That's an average. There are some farmers with one acre, there are farmers with three acres, but by ownership around two acres. By possession, okay, it's around five acres at an average. So when you go into a village, how do you identify which farmer family you can work with? Is it because someone comes to you or do, how do you assess, I mean, are there certain skill sets or mindsets that they need to have to work with you? Yes. So the fundamental aspect what when we select a farmer family is farmer family should work in the farm. Okay, it should not be labor driven. You can take labor, okay, to help, but it is not labor driven. For example, so if you are a techie, you can't say, you know, I'll continue to work in Bangalore and uh, I'll employ labor and get it done now. So if you are a techie, it's very good, okay, and come down, okay, stay in the farm, take the ownership, drive that. So that's fundamental. Uh, but if, in, in, in a village, when we go, we want to make sure father and son, okay, they are in the same wavelength, our husband and wife, they are in the same wavelength, uh, entire family is in the same wavelength. That's one fundamental selection criteria. They see farming, okay, as their means, okay. From there, okay, and we would like to ensure there are people in the family who are, okay, around 30 to 35 years of age. The, uh, father, okay, could be 45, 50 years. We, we, actually, they are the one who are driving the farming right now. But we want to make sure the young generation, okay, at least we set examples in the village saying that, you know, young generation, they are taking up the farming. This is a fundamental selection criteria when you pick a farmer. Of course, the second uh, criteria ob obviously is we look at their uh, borrowing habits, okay, how they are borrowing from self-help groups, are they paying on time, they are borrowing from JLGs, are they paying on time, these joint liability groups. Um, and are they borrowing from okay, neighbors and they are paying on time. And why do you do that? Is that because they have to borrow from you to set up the farm? No, it's made of a discipline. Are they disciplined? Okay, it's very, very important. Okay, um, If they are not disciplined okay, on financial matters, so what we are trying to do is setting up a role model okay, in that village is not going to work. And the third aspect, okay, yeah, a little bit um, we can... Uh, a lot of people don't agree with this, but third and important aspect is we don't work with any families where there is a habit of drinking okay, and habit of smoking. So if you really look at 100% okay, of the violence okay, at families in villages happens after drinking. So male member okay, drinks and actually beats women. 100% okay, of the violence, it's, it, surveys do indicate that. So. These are three fundamental criteria. One is to do with the family cohesion. Second, with the discipline. Third is okay, um, some okay habits like drinking is not allowed. Yeah. So when you when you go into a village, you only work with one family. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Right. Why is that? 
See, the same problem I'm trying to solve. So my father, okay, had a role model engineer in Bangalore. So he made me an engineer. What we want to do is we want to make this farmer as a role model for that village. So that's the reason we don't need many farmers, okay, to set a movement. What we need to do work is in maybe five to seven years, we need to work with one farmer and prove in that village saying that farming is doing very well off. Then every, okay, uh, people in that village, uh, our parents in that village start telling their children, hey, you know what, so he's living very well. He's looking after his parents, giving good education to children. Why don't you to be also one? Maybe when it's a kid when completes his graduation, okay, he will start looking farming very positively. That's the whole idea. And how much can they earn from this? See, right now, if you really look at Akshay Kalpa, in the Akshay Kalpa entire integrated model, at an average, Akshay Kalpa is paying 100,000 rupees per month to each farmer. That is the market okay, uh, we have created for those farmers. So about 1 lakh rupees yeah. per farmer is their gross income. Yes. Yeah. And But they have input costs in yes. terms of things. Yes. So what is their net margin? The, the, the 50% of that is costing, including his own labor. We cost his own labor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so all hard costs yes. in terms of seeds, seeds and, and... Plowing, uh, okay, and uh, labor. Okay, any of those aspects uh, involved, and of course his own labor, right. we count, count it, and it's fifty percent of it is a cost. Fifty percent is a net on hand. So yeah, it is equivalent to, okay, an uh, engineer, okay, a doctor, okay, or a chartered accountant, wow. going and living, okay, life, okay, in uh, cities. Right. This is exactly what the demonstrations we have done in twelve years. Right. Okay. You you mentioned that dairy forms the sort of the main yeah. stay that that sort of drives all the other activities on the farm. Um, let's go deeper on that. Um, how many cows must they have? Uh, what kind of cows? Um, a bit more. Yeah. So we should ask a question: Why dairy? Why not anything else? You said okay. cow dung, right? Huh. Yeah. So no, dairy solves two fundamental problems to the farmer. One thing is, it actually generates him a daily cash flows. So that removes a lot of, let us say, jitteriness, okay, in his mind. You know, where is my money coming from? Is it in three months, six months, or one year? That is removed. So what is, what, if you want to really do an intervention in the farm, fundamentally what we should do is, we should remove the economic, we should solve the economic aspect associated with the farming. That's very, very important. That's what a dairy solves. The fundamental first problem it solves. Second problem, what it does is, as I mentioned, it gives a second output, which is facing the soil. We can produce using this dung, using a uh, um, lot of biomass, okay, manure at a scale. So it solves two fundamental problems on the soil management and also on the cash flows. But dairy per se in Akshay Kalpa, the farmer generally starts off with one or two cows, okay. And over a period of five to seven years journey, you need to keep this one in mind. It is not an overnight transformation. Five to seven years of journey, we take farmer to okay have around 25 cows. Okay. So that's exactly what okay. Uh, so this one lakh income is after a certain period of time. Uh, see, at an average, for example, when they start, before they start itself, we would have worked with them for two years. We take them from a one or two cows, okay, to around five to seven cows. So we would have graduated in two years. Okay, post that when we do a market intervention, so that is when we actually we link them to banks and try to scale up the dairy unit and try to put some infrastructure, etc. So this is the, the hundred thousand what I mentioned was at an average. Okay, there are farmers who started just now earning thirty to forty thousand. There are farmers who started okay uh, ten years back, they are earning around five to six lakhs. So this is exactly how the spectrum uh, looks. But it's a it's a journey. So it's a overnight transformation okay, on generating money in farming is not possible. So a lot of okay, um, interventions actually in farming fail because we don't take it as a journey. We think, hey, you know what, get a tractor, cultivate, get an election inputs, so okay, um, uh, thousands and thousands of acres of the same crop. No, it is not sustainable. Maybe probably you'll get one crop, but second crop actually you get into market risks. So therefore, we should handhold him over a period of time. Five to seven years of handholding is required. Then he is on his own. He understands, you know, what I should do. He understands how to manage cows better. 
he understands data a little bit better, how to rear calves better, raise calves in his own farm rather than buying cows from outside. He understands that the entire ecosystem, then the dairy becomes uh, profitable. Right. And like I said, to the, to the dairy, the, the cows that uh, they end up having, you supply the cows there? Oh, no. So the way we do it is, we have got a very good veterinary team okay, and para-veterinary team. They help okay, them to select okay, uh, cows in the market when initially a, a dairy unit is started. But after two years of setting up the dairy, buying cows from outside stops. You have to raise your young stock yourself. So when initially when you are setting up a two cow, three cow, five cow unit, yes. But you can't buy 20, 30 cows in one go and start because managing that cows which are coming from outside have no history of, okay, what are the problems? The farmer generally fails. So the way we look at it is induct one or two cows, stabilize him, allow him to raise his calves, okay, raise them, okay, young stock, okay, and that's exactly the process. Is there any particular breed that you sort of support? See, right now we work with four uh, predominant breeds in our area. So it is, uh, in, uh, this is south of Karnataka. We work in around eight districts. So there is one uh, breed called Hallikar and Amrut Mahal. This is basically a drought breed, but we are trying to see if we can, okay, if we, if we put a 50 to 70, 100 year vision, can we okay get a good milkers out of it? That's and these are indigenous to this. They region. are indigenous to this area. This is one breed we actively work with, and also we work okay uh, with farmers on crossbreed jerseys and crossbreed Holstein Friesens. This is the one. And I believe there's a difference in yield between yes. them. Yes. Yeah. What is the difference? See, for example, uh, Hallikar right now, okay, wherever uh, uh, farmers are reading, it is giving around one and a half kg to two kgs per day milk. Okay. Now we are averaging around ten kgs per day in uh, the jerseys and uh, HFs, mm. that's what we are averaging. But wouldn't then therefore the farmer want the jerseys or the, the mixed breed? Uh, no, so the, the challenge here is we need to, that's what I mentioned, so diversification is the key. So I want, okay, um, um, the diversification in the farm or else what happens is if you go for a pure bred jerseys and pure bred HFs, the problem is the environment okay conditions whether they don't they don't adjust so that they should be always born from early car and amrut mahal so their parents are always some early car and amrut mahal we need to really ensure therefore local breeds are so important a lot of people don't understand it is not an emotional aspect it is science science of getting environment resilience and also probably able to produce better milk or more milk it is possible so therefore local breeds play such an important role right uh, Right. Speaking of science, let's uh, change gears. Um, what is the science behind sort of organic versus non-organic? Uh, because I want to also go into sort of the market aspect of it. Like all of this depends on obviously consumers wanting organic product. Yeah. So talk us through the science as to why as a consumer I should prefer organic. You yeah, see, the fundamental difference between organic okay, and then conventional okay, uh, production system is how and uh, when the external inputs are applied. For example, if, if you are producing, let me say, uh, rice, okay. Now, in a conventional system, okay, let us assume, okay, you have got a blast. Okay, rice blast is very common problem, okay. Um, when uh, it is flowering, okay, the rice blast comes and the entire crop gets destroyed. So, you do spray, okay. And um, that spray actually gets into, okay, uh, the ecosystem gets into the food okay uh, what finally you want to have for example you go to a lot of where irrigation is there let me say in gangavati belt in uh, karnataka very good irrigation um, but all the farms okay get sprayed okay and if you take a rice from gangavati belt and okay if you test it then you know okay what is actually you are eating in an organic system you don't get into those kind of aspects in an organic system, first thing what you do is you cut the external inputs, okay, and you try to see can you localize all of it. For example, external inputs initial days still might be required. Can I localize that external input? For example, if you take rice, okay, as an example. Let's let's take dairy as an example. Yeah, right? it's a good yes. example. Okay? Given that given that we're working yes, with dairy. Yeah, here. for example, so dairy is an example. External feeds, so concentrate feeds. You want to get it from outside from a feed supplying company, or you want to grow yourself. 
and feed it to the cow, the fundamental difference. So therefore, that input to the cow for milk production, okay, you start localizing in your farm, okay, and integrate. That's the reason it takes two years. So that's the input. Stage. In the milk, is there a difference in nutrition or yes. what am I getting? What are the other sort of, I guess, the external inputs that I'm getting in the milk that, that shouldn't be there? So the good that you ask this question and uh, if you really look at our uh, food safety standards, they're amazing, okay? FSSI says, okay, Food Safety Standards Association of India says, they're the premier, uh, okay, um, enforcement body. Milk should not have antibiotics. Right. Conventional or otherwise. Okay. Okay. In our current conventional production systems, antibiotic usage is indiscriminate. Farmers actually use, okay, um, themselves, veterinarians use. 60% of antibiotics which you inject to an animal comes out in milk. Wow. Okay, and uh, remaining around probably 30% goes as a defecation, probably 10% stays in the body. So this is exactly how it is happening. Now if you really go and check World Health Organization search, WHO antibiotic resistance. It says the biggest threat to human okay health. And this is not just in India. Do you think this is happening worldwide? Worldwide, okay. India is India is probably extreme side. We don't acknowledge it, okay. So there is uncontrolled use of antibiotics on animals. And what is the harm? I'm assuming there's a harmful effect. Uh, what is the harmful effect? And is that sort of more um, more harmful to children, young children, because they drink more milk compared to adults? The harmful effect is very simple, okay, if you are consuming an antibiotic every day, when actually an antibiotic is used on you, okay, treat you, you don't respond. So that's the fundamental problem of antibiotics in our food, so dairy, poultry. So, so our immune system is not reacting. reacting. I'm now making a very big leap here, but do you think, um, given the pandemic that we just had, that's a big problem that we... Yes will be more, um, uh, yeah, we won't be as immune or resistant to diseases. See, the pandemic was, an, in my opinion, is a symptom. Okay, the fundamental problem lies somewhere else. In Where was the problem, opinion? in your opinion? The problem, in my opinion, is the food, okay, what we are taking. So that's where the fundamental problem is. If you, since you asked the question, what is the difference in a dairy and an organic, mm. okay, in a conventional production system, an organic production systems, okay, um, Usage of antibiotics, if at all used, milk needs to be segregated. It cannot be taken into the system. Okay, so that is fundamental. Okay, difference in terms of that's the antibiotics, and also the the pesticides and the fertilizers, right? See, when you grow feed and fodder, hmm. okay, when you are getting an outside input, the aflatoxins. The biggest problem in milk today is aflatoxins. Okay, M1 aflatoxin. We don't acknowledge. It's the biggest carcinogen you can ever ever take. Most of the cancer issues are associated with aflatoxin. Basically, aflatoxin is a, a fungal okay, growth which happens in the feed and fodder. Animals consume it okay, and uh, that gets into our food system, aflatoxins. We don't acknowledge. FSSA is very clear what should be the aflatoxin levels in milk. So why is FSSI not doing anything about it? So we don't know. So for example, if they take a hard stand, so its livelihoods are in question. So that's exactly how it is. There's a difference between a livelihood. They need to take a balance view between a livelihood and a public health. Probably I will take a view on public health and work with people okay, who are okay, producing that and correct it. But nobody is there to correct it. So the problem is that. Problem FSSA faces is that. FSSA can create a rule and put okay, something on companies. Okay? But who is solving the problem there? Right, which leads me to scale, um, and we'll talk about the market sort of access as well, but now that we've raised FSSI, I mean, I believe uh, we became self-sufficient in milk, in dairy, post-operation uh, yeah. flood, Operation right? Flood, yeah. uh, white, the white revolution. The white revolution. Um, for people who may be not old enough, perhaps could you just give a quick summary of the green revolution and white revolution, and which kind of leads to, I guess, the our yields increase because of increased external inputs and we still subsidize them, right? Yes. So Give us a crash yeah. course in the in the revolutions. See, um, I think the dairy revolution in India, what happened, it, it, it is a very good, okay, um, I believe, starting point. 
okay kurian has to solve that problem okay and in a cooperative model okay is able to bring that change in you know what you produce a commodity i will give you a good access to market for that so this exactly the fundamental problem is solved okay and livelihoods okay start for example we all grew because my parents were selling milk okay to uh, cooperative nandini so okay in my village right so, so nandini is, is a the south indian version uh, of amul, amul right? exactly yeah. yes yeah. okay and they have done nandini for example they have done amazing work on livelihoods right. okay and giving market access right. okay this is exactly what okay the operation flood or what you can call white revolution is all about can okay give in market access to a little bit of milk what okay each one of it wasn't just market access didn't they also sort of um give the the fertilizers as well yes yeah the so lot of changes do did happen okay on the production side for example we started supplying feeds okay supplying feed became a common okay aspect so the four feed companies came into existence cooperative themselves for example amul themselves supply feeds okay nandini themselves supply feeds most of the cooperatives are private players in the country do supply feeds to farmers okay there's an external input getting into that okay so that's the that's the journey they took okay in the increasing the production number of animals went up because there was a market access okay and uh, still around uh, 60% of our okay milk production is informal means the it is not pouched or marketed but local consumption or a family consumption is still happens we are in the path now taking this all this informal market okay and converting it to formal market that's not the solution we should be really looking at so while the operation flood okay uh, the white revolution solved fundamental problem of market access and of course external inputs okay coming to the farm so trying to increase the milk production of the animals breeding changed okay cross breed programs did come in okay through this program that played a fundamental role in getting a better quality animals okay into entire production system amazing work happened but what okay lacked okay in this entire process is the animal okay efficiencies and quality of the production so those two actually took a back seat okay as part of um uh, the white revolution that is when the problem started uh, cropping up so in in your view th- because we put this external inputs in um the the end product has suffered okay. so even though we've solved for livelihoods yes. we have affected public health public health and also the profitability of the farmer since he is buying external inputs okay. we see the cost of production okay. so right now why farmer struggles with cost of production so the animal is a foraging animal we should have focused on forages okay yes some of the universities did focus on forages very good work they have done for example in uh, south of india tanwas okay um you know tamil nadu agriculture university they have done a wonderful work on napier grasses okay and um, um lot of testing okay which happens on the field and fodder okay trying to tell us a nutrition value but it is too small okay i think too late that's what let's talk market access a little bit as well so um what do you offer to farmers how how do you buy their produce um and how is it different from conventional see currently for example if you look at a dairy as an system it works on the collection model you go to a village set up a collection center you collect the milk okay if people are producing 1 liter 2 liters 5 liters 20 liters okay and take them to your nearest chilling center okay chill the milk and get into your processing okay and get into market no we don't follow this uh, at all we don't have no collection systems individual farmer okay produces close to 150 to 200 liters of milk himself so he has got his own chilling facility so okay yeah so it is mandatory for each and every farmer to have a chilling facility okay starting from 100 liters to 200 liters to 500 liters chilling facility he chills his own milk basically technically he did a value addition which chilling centers were doing so he earns better money okay out of that okay so therefore some of the aspects which we thought industry should be doing yeah. what we did was we moved towards the farmer for example farmer certifies his own milk no need to certify his milk and he tests his own milk data gets into the cloud okay and he chills his own milk he earns substantial out of that so fundamental change the way we operate okay when compared to a conventional system on the farm side 
Second thing is... The and therefore you give a different price, a more value-added price yes, to them. Yes. What is a, what, just for my understanding, hmm. what is the sort of going rate? See, for example, we are paying around 38 rupees per litre to, okay, farmer. Right. Okay, nearest competitors do pay 32 rupees, right. okay, to the milk. Of course, um, uh, what happens is on the seasonality, okay, farmer gets less, what you call a flush season. Okay, in a rainy season, okay. But in that, in Akshakalpa system, that is removed. Okay, Akshakalpa, no seasonality changes. It is constant pricing. That's what we have done. Okay, and, and that is, um, and sorry, that is for, when you say competitors, that means organic competitors or non-organic? No, everybody, conventional. Okay. Conventional, yeah. Okay. And then what do you do with that milk? So right now, uh, we are processing around 75,000 liters of milk and we have got a processing facility. That's where the value addition is happening. We do, okay, we do pack milk, okay, ghee, butter, cheese, paneer, okay, and uh, cheeses, curd, buttermilk, that's what we do. That's at the Akshay Kalpa level? Yes. That's at this company yes. level? Right, okay, okay. Um, actually, let's talk about the company itself. Uh, you, you said you started t more than 10 years ago. Um, what was the financial sort of commitment like? I'm a financial analyst, so I'm interested now in the numbers. Mm. What does it take to set up something like this? And, and what sort of returns would you get, if any? See, uh, you ask a very uh, good question, okay? At least if you look at Akshay Kalpa journey, we, we didn't add any entrepreneurship background, okay? The first, uh, we all 27 people, we thought we'll change the world, okay? But when we actually started working, we realized the capital required to set up an enterprise like this, it is very substantial. We never had access to that kind of capital, okay? The initial capital what we pulled was 27 people getting together. Okay, initially we pulled around 1.5 crores. We started working on that. Every time we got into distress, these 27 people put a little bit more equity. Okay, took the company, okay, for nine years of journey. First nine years, okay, um, what we did was, okay, solve the fundamental problem on production. Not much on the market side. What the yeah. startup world calls the MVP, yes, the minimum yeah, viable yeah, product. product yeah. You basically built an yes. MVP. Yeah, okay. it took nine years. Okay. Okay, to really work with farmers. Okay, making sure they understand what we are saying, and build that one. We took nine years. Okay, so that's the initial equity came in, and of course, um, in 2019 we did uh, went and raised a Series C around 40 crore rupees. Okay, and uh, July 22 we went and raised around 117 crores of uh, series b that's the only money we have raised uh, okay. so far okay and where did rain matter come in so rain matter did come in uh, in two parts in 2020 we got into cash flow issues in middle of a pandemic so rain matter did come in and supported okay with around five crore rupees commitment okay and the series b they did come in and invested around 60 crores yeah. Okay. And what difference does that make to scale? So talk, talk scale. Where are you at now? How many villages are you serving? How much are you producing? So right now we, we work with around 850 farmers, okay, in around 900 villages. So that's what we do. Okay. And an average farmer income is at... Okay, this is all around Bangalore? So all around in Tiptur cluster. Okay. It is Tiptur. It's on Tumko district. Yep. So we touch around uh, eight uh, districts, okay, in, in the uh, periphery. Um, we got our second cluster, so your question is, what will you do? Now we have started seeding our second cluster, cluster outside Chennai. When we arrived Series A, we started seeding the cluster. It's now four years journey. We are still not procurement started, maybe in a couple of months we start there. And we started seeding a cluster outside Hyderabad. Okay, we started seeding a cluster near to the Pune, Mumbai. Okay, okay we started okay. that work. So we'll get that soon. Yeah, yeah, four okay. years. Yeah, we have to wait. Okay, yeah. so th that's what this capital makes lot of difference to the work what we do on the back end also capital okay makes we can do a structured marketing akshakalpa never did a structured marketing most of for example akshakalpa right now we do 20 crore rupees sales month on month okay and we never did a structured marketing it is all word of mouth okay and that's exactly how we build the product uh, most of the sales so, do so come that from... On, yeah. the, on the back of sort of people wanting more organic. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So what about, um, and, and this is just uh, sort of cu curiosity, is would you classify this under impact investing where what sort of returns would someone like Rain Matter or other investors get? Would they be on par with sort of what the listed market does? See, what we are trying to prove, okay, is that farming is viable. Right. Okay, we are saying for a farmer, farming is viable. So therefore any investors 
impact or otherwise. Okay, we want to make it viable. So probably 20 to 25 percent IRR. Okay, it's a good number. Okay, for anybody to really look at investing, and of course uh, we want to prove that. Okay, you know, investing in companies like this, we are mostly impact driven. Okay, um, uh, farm farming companies. It is a viable investment for okay external people to come and invest. Or can grow this okay space. Right. So that's on the financial side. On the impact side, so livelihoods, farmer livelihood, we've 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 talked about. One big issue that comes up in in global conversations around dairy is, or rather on cattle, is uh, methane, sort of uh, contributing a big proportion. Some apparently 24% or something to greenhouse emissions. And one of the conversations that I get is, oh, you know, uh, India has more cattle than anywhere else in the world. We produce more milk, but we have more cattle. In fact, we have apparently, I don't know if the numbers are right, it sounds like we, we, we contribute a big proportion, but we have big factors, some 10 times the amount of cattle. So we're unproductive and we're causing methane. How are you solving that problem? See, the f first of all, I think there are a lot of misconception on cattle. So most of the articulation on the cattle, okay, comes from how the Western countries they have built a cattle industry. 10,000 cows under a roof, 15,000 cows under a roof, 20,000 cows under a roof. Their management is terrible. Cow condition is different. Methane gas impacts, okay, huge. Impact on soil is huge. So we are taking those kind of articulations Okay, in the Indian context. In the Indian context, we need to really look at how the dairy is done in India. It's very different. For example, each farmer has one or two cows. Okay, morning when he goes, he takes those two cows to his farm and comes back with the same cows. Okay, the management is so simple. Okay, though uh, in an organized dairy sector in India, it is getting complicated. Some of the problems we have, those needs to be solved. We need to look from that context. Okay, if so you, you, are you saying that just this? A herd versus individual yeah. cows will solve the problem. Most think? of the problems actually really? get solved. Yes. I don't understand. So, so, how does the biology work? I mean, the cow produces the same methane, yes. Yes. whether individually or in a yes. herd of hundred. Yes. How is it different? For example, if you put a ten thousand cows under one roof, okay, you see, okay, um, amount of nutrition you are moving, okay, from one place to other place. To feed a cow, you need nutrition. You need to really understand where did that nutrition come from. Somebody grew it. So that's separate. That's separate. No, no, I'm talking the, about just the output, the the, 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 the farting, the belching, right? Yes, the belching and farting, everything, yeah. okay, is counted in methane. Yeah. So if it, fundamentally it, it comes to a fact that what did you do with the dung? Okay. Okay, you ask that question. Okay. But dung is separate from the belching, right? I mean, you're still no, releasing. No, no, you're still releasing. But ah. what we do, most of the releasing, okay, is not from farting and this one. When a, when a dung okay gets okay in a anaerobic part, the methane gas gets released. So the way we are solving it is every dairy unit, it is mandatory to have a methane gas production system, where you catch the methane gas in a very very structured manner, okay, and uh, take it through heating or a cooking process. So there's a lot of. So you're recycling the methane from the dung yes. to use for energy purposes Correct. at the farm level itself. Correct. See, that's what the, the entire the problem. For example, why? Okay. Uh, so, if if India started doing the way you are doing, do you think our emissions, our methane emissions, would come down? Yes. See, the dairy will not be a problem in India. So, the way our dairy system is structured, it is not a problem in India. And uh, Western articulation is a problem. Okay, the way they looked at, they saw the problems because they created those problems. They started seeing those problems. Now they think it's also the same problem exists here. So it is not true. Okay. And, and mm -hmm. so why is India not saying that? I mean, uh, in terms of like, from, from what I can see, they are saying, well, we need to sort of have greenhouse emissions, but I guess most, mostly from industrial sort of purposes rather than cattle, no, right? so For example, coal burning is a big problem. Okay. Okay. That's okay. separate. So right? yeah, that's a okay. different problem. Yeah. Okay. Automobile industry is a different problem. All okay. of that we have to yes. get to certain yes. standards. But you're saying cow or cattle is not the problem. Problem, yes. Right, okay. okay. See, the, um, uh, and see, what we need to really understand is how the cattle is integrated to farmers' okay, ecosystem. That needs to be really looked into. Okay, so what, you've, what you have done is created a model and it's working in these hundreds of villages. How do you scale it pan India? How do you convince policy? How do you convince the government or I'm assuming 
the government, but how do you convince others to do it this at scale? It's a very interesting uh, question. So my job, I believe in Akshay Kalpa is to collect enough data to prove that farming is viable, cows can be managed better, more efficiently. With the same feed and fodder, you can produce better milk, more milk. With that data, it is available, I should say open source, anybody can copy that. Scaling Pan India is not my problem. What is my problem I'm trying to solve is, can we prove at a decent scale, connect data at decent, decent scale, and show everybody, hey, this is a viable system, you can copy. Okay, you so you're open, you're open to, for anyone to copy your yes. model? Yes, everybody is openly invited to our farms. Okay. They can just walk in. Okay, yeah. okay. so there, there are, um, I believe, um, there are some at least seven, eight other organic dairy farms in India at scale. Are they doing things the same way that you are doing? Are they doing differently? Do you know? See, um, I don't know how they are doing, okay, but some of them are a big farm models where a lot of cows under one roof. Actually, in my opinion, this is quite risk, okay, associated with that. Same risk, okay, what, okay, um, you see in the Western countries. But we need to really go and start working with farmers distribute, okay, right. the entire risk. So out. as a consumer, just because I see organic milk, I am, I may not uh, sort of uh, know whether they have done it the way you have done yes. it or whether they've done it, yes. I mean, without pesticides perhaps, or hopefully, hopefully without yes. that, if they've been certified organic, but not the same way. Yes, yeah. Right? So to, to, to in that journey, it's very important you get consumers and educate them. We, right. We, we so I, yeah, I was going to say, so why do you, I mean, why do you, um, hmm. I shouldn't say why. Um, Akshay Kalpa comes across as a dairy sort of producer, but you're much more than dairy, as I can mm. see, right? Um, is it is there perhaps a marketing branding opportunity for you yes. to sort of do a more integrated farming? Yes. So, in fact, uh, as I mentioned, yeah. we are not a good marketeers. <laughs> okay, so most of it is happened is right. okay, the friends and uh, the word of mouth. We will reach there. Okay, but the fundamental of marketing is, I think, get consumers and show what we are doing. I think they should become our spokesperson. Okay. That's exactly what we are trying to do. On weekends night now, the traffic is as big as 400 people visiting. Wow. Okay, to yeah, see I saw so consumers walking around. Yes. So you, you invite them here yes, to learn yes. farming? Yeah, we invite them and they go to a website and register. Okay. okay, they could be our consumers, not consumers, it's all fine. Okay, okay look around, okay, play with the cows, yeah. feed the cows. Okay, work with a farmer, stay in a farmer family. And yeah. farmers who are not working with you but just want to come and see how they're doing, they're, 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 they're welcome. welcome. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and does that not cost money for you to... Yes, sort of we do invest, okay, some amount of, okay, human capital, okay, showing them around what needs to be done. Yeah. But I believe any business, okay, needs to behave a little bit responsibly. You're not a standalone silo. You still need to work with people, okay, who are not part of your business ecosystem. You cannot be so narrow okay views on uh, whom do you work or whom do you do. for example our veterinary para veterinary yeah. services is available to all the farmers right. okay at the same okay uh, way it is available to our farmers oh really yeah yeah so yeah. any any farmer who is not even associated with you can, can use your services, vet services, services. Yes. veterinary and para veterinary services okay therefore i believe the businesses needs to start thinking like this right. okay and this all this csr is in my opinion right. we, is overhyped right. so, Okay, some percentage you keep it. No. When you won't work in the field, you integrate with the local society. That is very, very important in a coexistence system. One of the outcomes that people talk about is um, sort of building more resilient systems. I believe your farmers were able to weather a recent disease, right? Was it a lumpy skin disease? LSD, yeah, a lumpy skin disease. It's, it's a disaster uh, to the nation. What was required was a vaccination which cost 10 rupees. It's called goat pox. Okay, if you had vaccinated your cows with goat pox, zero incidents. In our, right now, Akshay Kalpa manages 11,000 cows. We are tagged and tracked. All the data is in cloud. Zero incidents of LSD, okay, in our so, LSD. So just to clarify, all your cows are vaccinated. Yes. Okay, so you, you don't believe in antibiotics, but you do believe right, in vaccination. vaccination. Yes. Yeah. It's very, very important. Okay, we need to really, that's what I'm trying to say. We need to get into science. Antibiotics is science. It is not, okay, anything else. Mm. So uh, how do you use antibiotics is a science. Mm. How do you make sure anti there's no mm. antibiotic in milk is a science. So you're an engineer and therefore you can talk science. How do you convince about science in the villages that you work in? See, we can't, okay. So for example, the way I really look at it is for our farmers, keeping bees mm. is mandatory. Mm. 
Every farmer has to have five bee boxes. So if you go and tell him, hey, you know, it helps in pollination, he doesn't listen. So for me, what I'll tell is, you know, you got a bee box, five bee boxes is required. Whatever honey comes, I will give you market access. He is actually happy. But what is the fundamental problem you are solving? You are fund solving a fundamental problem of pollinator. So that's exactly how our intervention in dairy also. If you go and tell a lot of theory on this one, they don't. We we have created thumb rules. You feed this much. Okay, you know, you tell me how much you are feeding. The okay, uh, app is saying, okay, this is deficient. You fix it. So that's exactly how it needs to work. So we need to base on science. Okay, make sure farmers give enough data to as an input to the system to work. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to really look and at. And the way you make them work is through the incentives, as you said, the market yeah. access. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Speaking of which, um, I think uh, we want to see some of the farms. Yeah. So can we see a few different places? I would love to see, um, so we've, we're looking at yeah. the veggie patch, but we want to see the cows. Yes. We want to see um, the methane yeah. sort of production. We want to see the value addition yeah. sort of plant. Um, we want to see the bees. Yes. Um, anything else that we should be seeing while we're here? So I think uh, that's it. So th you can see the bee box there. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then we'll take the camera there. Yes. Okay. Before we do that, anything else that uh, we've not covered that you'd like to sort of put on the table? See, one aspect is okay. Um, as I told, one of the most important role, okay, we forget is the consumer. Okay, he needs to be educated on food. Okay, he should start questioning, okay, on some of the food habits what he has, so that okay we can start encouraging lot more farmers to produce food okay which is quality conscious mm. so. i guess that what stops people is one the way the food looks and two is the cost yes. um, do you have any data in terms of who your consumers are and what sort of socioeconomic class is consuming your so, organic interesting uh, question um, on this consumer profile side most of them are middle class families and they take our milk for the children while for them they continue to take the conventional milk so, so the, the cons consumers are so conscious now what gets into their children's plate. It's very important. So their cost is an issue, which is why they yes. themselves are willing yes. to have normal milk. But for their children who are growing, yes. they, they take, take organic. Milk. Wow. Sacrifices parents make for their children. Yes, huh? yeah, amazing, isn't it? Right, yeah. right. But it is middle class India that you think. Yes. Uh, so when, what, just just for could pe people refer to the Indian middle class, mm. and then they talk selling iPhones. Mm. Um, what what do you define as middle class? So for me, okay, a middle class is anywhere earning between thirty thousand rupees, okay, per month, okay, to around a hundred thousand rupees, okay. That's the which is the same sort of class as what the farmers are. Yeah, correct. Right? Exactly. The farmers are basically also yes. similar to your consumers. Exactly. They just happen to live in villages yeah, rather than exactly. in exactly the urban cities. Is, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, Rain Matter has this philosophy of being place-based solutions and being, I guess, um, uh, sort of the full ecosystem. Today I've seen an example of that. Um, how did that come about? How did you meet Rain Matter? Interesting it seems, question. I mean, is it a coincidence that both of you have the similar philosophy or who influenced whom? <laughs> so, I've known uh, Samir for a while, okay, um, and um, I think what they are trying to do uh, is um, how do we solve this one at a scale? Okay, how can we get a lot of players who are doing these solutions, small, 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 ours is a small initiative. How do we get all of them together? I think that's the meeting point. Some of the things uh, what we are trying to do. I think uh, 2020 it happened, okay. So they, they participated actually, okay, um, uh, through equity, yeah. So I think, I, I guess maybe what you've done on the ground probably influenced their thinking. Yeah. Is there anything that you learned from them? So it's amazing, no? The ecosystem, okay, what they have now. Mm -hmm. For example, right now I work with Vikas, okay, from Rain Matter mm -hmm. uh, on replacing, okay, uh, let me say milking machines which are running on, let me say, kerosene engines, mm -hmm. okay, or a diesel engines with a battery, okay, which is operated by solar, okay, and same battery can be used okay for a tiller okay as well as okay and a milking machine so thin though i'm working that solve those kind of problems okay second thing is lot of data which is on the uh, social aspect okay they collect lot of social data okay income profiles our uh, spend uh, patterns they collect lot of data like that so we also collect lot of data okay there's uh, one more uh, synergy i see and um, of course it's access to bigger ecosystem where people are solving 
can you bring some of those solutions here rather than we reinventing for example entire methane gas okay we reinvented okay it was there you can see all those balloons everything so we reinvented so probably we would have solved it that one easily by somebody who already have it because you didn't know that solution exactly. existed yes, somewhere yeah. else right Okay, so we've talked a lot, but we came here to the farm to actually see some of the good work that you're doing. So can we go and see some of the work? Very much. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. let's start. I'm happy to look, show you around. Yeah. The crux of the experiment is this one acre plot with raised vegetable beds, which protects them from flooding while giving them extra nutrients in the special soil mix. These beds can be made with local boulders. This whole veggie patch is managed by one person and can feed up to 100 families. Around this veggie patch is the fodder growth area, dotted with taller trees such as bananas and coconuts, taking up another acre. Note that there are some bee boxes at the edges that help with pollination, leading to increased yields of all crops. I've seen coconut yields almost doubling. Let's see the dairy now. The dairy unit typically starts with two to three cows, going up to 25 with a mix of cow breeds. The vet helps farmers track cow health and milk yields. And then here is the methane capture unit, which supplies the gas for kitchen and heating purposes. This is where the dung goes into the system. From here it gets into this. Now on the far end it comes out. Okay. It goes to one more pit there, then goes to the farm from there. From directly from a pipe? A pipe, thing. yes. Akshay Kalpa works very closely with the farmers. It fabricates and supplies the tools from this facility. Importantly, it handholds the farmers with free education and also free veterinary services for all farmers, not just the ones they work with. There's even a special women's group that goes out to engage with the women in the farmer families. Akshay Kalpa then buys the organically produced milk from hundreds of such small farms around one city and processes this into value-added products such as packaged pasteurized milk, curd, buttermilk, butter, ghee and cheese. The whole process is organic, ensuring that there are no chemicals added. The milk is then transported to the nearby largest city such as Bengaluru or Chennai. Customers can order the milk on an app and they can come here to camp on weekends to see how the whole thing works. The end result, apart from the organic milk products for customers of course, is the improved life of the farmer. Farmer incomes start at 35,000 rupees, going up to a few lakhs, with the average of just under a lakh a month. It is March 23, his monthly revenue is 145,000 rupees. Wow. This is the, not our peak level. I have a goal of 10 lakhs. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Climate Conversations. We look forward to hearing from you. Any suggestions, feedback, thoughts, maybe your own experiments. Until next time, I'm Hansi.